after I wrote Cocktails. And most people, when they do a memoir or any kind of, they research and mm-hmm. do all this stuff. I never did none of that. <laughs> I just wrote it right. and, uh, as I remembered it. And so when uh, Ray and Slick and everybody got together, they said they was going to rewrite Cocktails <laughs> and and do a Their sequel. Own yeah, and I said, well, what are you going to call it? And they said, the truth. <laughs> they... <laughs> Something in the water told me how to crawl. Something in the water told me how to fall. Something in my hey, welcome to another episode of Something in the Water. We're here with Dave Griffin and Sean Clark. And yeah. our guest for today is Mr. James Cock. From Valdosta, Georgia, currently, but originally, he was my next door neighbor growing up on Dog Hill. He's definitely been, we've definitely brought James up on many a episodes yeah, y'all with have, these Dog Hill Tales. Y'all have watched these uh, podcasts. You've heard us talk about James and uh, either uh, either through conversation or in one of my Tale of the Week stories. Mm-hmm. So, James, it's good to have you. <laughs> well, it's good to be here. <laughs> and we've been talking ever since we walked in the door. That's so right. Just a continuation. I guess I'll be the first guest on here that can't carry a tune in a bucket. <laughs> <laughs> well, we no. said a long time ago, we'll never make it t- uh, to episode 50 if we're just relying on sorry ass musicians. <laughs> no, no offense, sorry ass musicians. <laughs> we uh, we are we are too also. And uh but yeah, we we uh we glad to have you because you are a consummate storyteller. Well, I appreciate That's, that. That's that not the only thing you're good at, but uh Lord uh, you're you're an author. You have written. Let's see. Uh, uh, your first book would have been this one, right? Papa's Dream. Yeah, I did that, that from a little grandchildren. Your first book, and that, and I don't have a uh, saved picture on that. But if you hold that up towards Justin over there, just just angle it right over that way, and uh, yeah. yeah, there you go. Hold it up a little bit. There you go. Well, that's the co- the copy of the cover right there. That was your first one. Yeah, I did this while I was waiting on cocktails, memoirs of a redneck hippie, which is the story of my life. But I was waiting on it to get edited, and I had so much trouble. So I decided, and I had only one eye that I could see out of. So I thought, well, I better do something. F- you know, before I lose the other one, oh. so I I just wanted to play and, but I could never get the pictures to pop like I wanted it. And yeah, but that's pretty fascinating. I mean, you drew the pictures, yeah. you drew the artwork mm-hmm. for this. It's a children's book, right? And this is just a story that you made up, right? Yeah, yeah. And probably well, told your grandchildren. Oh yeah, my <laughs> my old redneck neighbor down the road. He says. James, what was you smoking when you told that story? <laughs> well, and I know what, and I was just was speaking just of that. Speaking of what was you smoking? Uh, you know, we we all grew up in that uh, that generation. Hush your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, there's plenty of tales and cocktails. Uh, Justin, how about this, Justin? On them random pics that I emailed you. Pull up the number one from about nineteen fifty five of a bunch of, of five kids sitting on a sitting on a. Uh, There's a word for <laughs> that thing. No, it's actually a, a style. 
uh, it's a style that's got steps on both sides of the fence. That's it. And it straddles oh. the fence. So you can, you climb up this little foot ladder and get to the top and you come down the other side. You know, it's right. got steps on both sides of the fence. That is that is the original, well, three of the original Dog Hill gang on the front row. <laughs> it's like the Little Rascals. <laughs> well, you got uh, right, uh, uh, left to right on the front row is my brother Gary, who was nicknamed many years later when we started handing out nicknames, uh, Tick. <laughs> and that's me next to Tick. And next to me, right there on the ride, is is James, right here, and he's got that right eye closed <laughs> because of the sun. You always took a picture facing the sun back in them days. That's a great picture, though. I can't see it anymore, but but I remember it. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and behind uh, Gary up there is James's older brother Wayne. Who's still kicking? Yeah, and he's how many years older than you? Uh, four. I four. Think. Yeah, and then next to him is my mine and Gary's cousin, first cousin, Wanda Cheshire. <laughs> the, the, the good thing about it, we all kicking. <laughs> yeah, every one of us. That's that's right there uh, in between. Uh, our house and James's house on Dog Hill. Many years later, we we played all kinds of sports in that, that pasture right there behind us. Many injuries. Mm, good gracious, love. What's this? What's the next picture? We'll kind of look at these, and uh, I got them in uh, chronological order. That one is about. What sixty one or two? Who, who all's and in there? Sixty one. Sixty one. That's left to right. There's Wanda again, and behind her is her older brother Stan. He's gone now, and there's me on the front. Gary behind me, and you next to Gary. We were headed to the movie theater. It's a Saturday afternoon. We posed in the. Uh, God, I'm trying to see. Exactly. I can't tell what part of the yard that was in. Exactly. I think that I'm not sure. Well. But anyhow, um, next, we was going to the movies, though, and that probably to see the longest day. And uh, what is that? there is your... Your granddaddy, Mr. Ooh. Lotz, and or your, and as your you, sister. and my little sister Deb on his lap, and he's sitting on that red step stool made out of wood. Looks like a little ladder, kind of. Looks like a foot mm -hmm. footstool, kind of ladder. I don't know if you remember that or not. It was Absolutely. bright red. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And he, they're sitting in front of y'all's garden. Yep, that was kept so neat by me and that hoe I worked, <laughs> worked with. And in the background back there, you see in that clearing, you see a little white dog. That was our dog, Sport. And that that grass that he's standing in is the original pasture where we bled and died every Saturday morning. <laughs> yeah. Tackle football. Now, we didn't mess around. We played tackle football, and that fence row in the very background ran all the way down the left-hand side. That was the sidelines of, of the left-hand side of the field, and uh, and it had barbed wire across the top of it, I think. You had to duck. <laughs> and you had to uh, be very crafty when you were skimming down that sideline because you I and Greg Griffin – uh, you were Sharky. Greg Griffin, our uh, neighbor across the street, was slick. Where'd all these names come from? I, yeah, we can tell you about the origination of them. But to, to, to this end now, Greg and James, they knew no fear on the football field. They would just, somebody would be running down that sideline and they would try to do a barrel roll tackle 
or just a, a straight on dive and tackle. It didn't matter. There was barbed wire right next to their heads or something. That just didn't matter. There was a weightlifter come out there and played with us. They was brothers. The Birch brothers. And uh, the, the biggest one, the tallest one, I ducked at the coal line, and he reached to grab me. And uh, <laughs> there was actually a bush to the left, so it was an alley I was trying to scoot in. And he grabbed that bob wire with his hand, and he missed me and ripped his hand open. And so we won the game. That was it. And he says, oh, hell no. I ain't through. And the, I mean, blood and guts coming out of his hand. Oh. And we stayed and played a little longer. He finally had to give it up. <laughs> oh god! Didn't one of them uh, dislocate his ankle or something? And Not that still I don't remember. Play- they were playing in brogans. Yeah, they had on brogan boots and was playing tackle football with us. They, they were big boys. Now. They was grown men, and we was just a little chilling. But uh, we had a good time. <laughs> we took on all comers. Uh, this uh, is James's. Granddaddy now, uh, Mr. and Ms. Lotz, they owned the house that was next door to ours growing up. And uh, at a very early age, you and Wayne and your mother came to uh, live with them. And uh, I guess would have been 50-something that y'all moved there. 56, you moved there, okay. So I would have been three. I remember Tick meeting Tick out there. I, I was four, mm-hmm. and uh, he would have been uh, six. He was about eighteen to me, and uh, <laughs> they brought out these boxing gloves, and Tick dotted my eyes and sent me home a squalling, and uh, that's how we met. <laughs> <laughs> that was about the age right there. <laughs> yeah, and. That, now tell about how you got revenge on the black eyes. You remember that story? Uh, I don't know about revenge on the black well, eyes. Well, it, it probably wasn't premeditated. I mean, but I mean, I don't remember. Uh, Is that the one where I hit you? The fertilizer. Oh. <laughs> they claimed. <laughs> well, I, there was a little pack house under the garage, I think is where it was, that, or somewhere over there at your house that you – Granddaddy had a bag of fertilizer in there. Well, actually, it was at, it was behind your house, mm. by your shed, and we mm. was looking over in that sack, and they claimed I threw fertilizer in Tick's eyes, and <laughs> I got in all kind of trouble about that. But <laughs> he could still see better than me, so I'm going to say I didn't do that. But, hey. Um, what's next, Justin? Yeah, this is uh, Christmas of 63? 63, yeah. And that's the front of our house there in Wake on Dog Hill. In, in 63? Mm-hmm. I was. <laughs> you'd have been 13, 12. No, thir- no you'd have been 13 in 63. No. That Gary would have been 13. Yeah, yeah, he was the old I'd man. I would have been 10, and you'd have been 11. Well, if our our buddies back then, you come down and we'd play ball in the backfield. One of them was named Johnny Bennett. And he lived he, on Dog Hill, too, at the and, other end. And he had a brother named David yep. that he was in Vietnam in, like, 60. Two, three, or four. I mean, in the very early days of Vietnam. And when he came home on a leave, right there on Dog Hill in our backyard, he pulled out a bag of reefer. Oh, Lord. That's the first time I ever seen any. <laughs> we didn't fool with it, but I in, seen it. In 63? It was 63, 63 or 64. I'll be dog. He was one of the first soldiers over there. Yeah. Yep, yep. But anyway, that was just yeah, keeping along the tales of cocktails. Mm-hmm. So that book uh, starts. Like, it, I've read it, but it's been a few years. Is it chronological or is it? Well, let me like- tell you, let me tell you what 
uh, any any listener out there that's thinking about writing a memoir, do it now, <laughs> because <laughs> if you wait, you lose. Yeah. And so I went six years with a little notepad in my pocket, and if if I remembered something, I'd write down a title, go home, put it on a yellow legal pad, and then later embellish on the stories a little bit and mm -hmm. and uh well when i got finished six years after and i tried to put it in chronological order i couldn't, couldn't i couldn't it. remember yeah <laughs> so uh and then my eyes started going out on me and i was having a heck of a time pulling it all together so i i just say if anybody wants to write a memoir or, or mm -hmm. a book or any kind do it now Mm -hmm. Don't delay. No time like the present, huh? That's right. That's right. But uh, uh, what uh, do we have a picture of the book cocktails right there too? Just let people see what that one looks like. That was your. That would have been your. That's probably in the in the uh, tale of the week uh, pictures. No, I'm not sure. It is. Okay. I sent him two emails, but there we go. That's the cover of the second book, Memoirs of a Redneck Hippie, and it is H-I-P-P-Y. <laughs> <Hell right. laughs> it is. <laughs> that shows you what I know. <laughs> I told you. <laughs> but that's, that's pretty fascinating, though. Uh, you are from the Dog Hill Gang. Well, I'll tell you about the nicknames now. Growing up there, you know. Uh, it was me and Gary, James next door, across the street from James was Greg Griffin, who was like third cousins with us. <clears throat> uh, well, we were at this end of the street, and Ray Heron, Billy Ray Heron, that everybody knows him as now, was kind of catty-cornered across the street, about two houses down and across the street, so that... Uh, he was past the dividing line, I guess. He was considered the other uh, end of the street, along with Johnny Bennett and Wayne Williams and the Thorntons, the Thornton brothers. Now, that was all of the, the guys on, on the road. And uh, occasionally the, the, that end would meet up with this end, you know. And, and the older that we got, that really became – the case, you know, we got to be teenagers and then playing that football and stuff in the back pasture. Well, Billy Ray and Johnny Bennett and all them would, they'd be down there forming teams, making it even, even sides. So uh, the older that we got, the nickname started coming. Uh, Sharky. Mm -hmm. I think. This is my version. You tell me what your version is, but I don't have one. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> yours will do just fine. Uh, well, um, my version is that you got the name Sharky because you were uh, you were prone to win. Didn't matter how you got there. You were very competitive, no hose barred. If it required a little bit of cheating, wait a minute. <laughs> if it required a little bit of cheating I'm to win. A, wait a minute, mine on you. <laughs> uh, but uh, let's see, Greg Slick, Greg Griffin. He uh, graduated in uh, uh, sixty nine from Waycross High School and went off to Atlanta to work for uh, Southern Bell. That's it was right. called Southern Bell back then. And uh, <clears throat> he had come home ever so often, you know. He'd, he'd come driving up to that brown Ford Pinto and he'd get out there and he would be Mr. Debonair. <laughs> he'd, done, he'd done gone to Atlanta and uh, he, he was slick. He, he was coming back when hair perfect and the leather jackets and all this uh, double knit uh, flare legged pants and uh, big time big time big time Greg <laughs> yeah, we but, called him slick but the truth is I remember when he first got up there 
he opened his apartment door one winter, and there was like a dead body on his oh. steps or something. And it, you know, that kind of woke him up as soon as he got there. Mm. It was kind of kind of rough to start with. Yeah. But, uh, <clears throat> dead body on the steps. <laughs> yeah, old slick. That would uh, put a uh, <laughs> note to self. <laughs> Be careful in the big city. Uh, Gary was tick, and it, that made it kind of neat that we had a slick and a tick. <laughs> a slick tick. And uh, tick, uh, the story that I always heard was that uh, when he went off to Georgia Southern, I mean South Georgia College over in Douglas, he was uh, he was following his uh, – uh, uh, vocation that his planned vocation was journalism. He started writing for this college newspaper over there, and he got to go on the uh, game trips with the baseball team and everything. And he'd he'd be on the bus with the uh, South Georgia Tigers baseball team. And he said he was a little old dude too. Gary was he was short and wiry. Uh, they said that he could crawl the sides of the bus like spider-man or like an insect and uh inside or outside inside inside the bus and uh somebody nicknamed him tick because he looked like a tick crawling around that bus now there was another story too don't look at me okay <laughs> i heard it one time but uh i can't remember exactly See, we should have done this podcast 10 years ago. <laughs> I, could, I could have told you. Well, Tick, the, the, one of the things about Tick is that he has a memory like a, an elephant. And we'll get him on here, and he'll, he'll be able to uh, lend some perspective and some truth <laughs> to these past things where we get sitting here racking our brains. The truth is... After I wrote cocktails, and most people, when they do a memoir or any kind of, they research and mm-hmm. do all this stuff. I never did none of that. <laughs> I just wrote it right. and, uh, as I remembered it. And so when uh, Ray and Slick and everybody got together, they said they was going to rewrite cocktails <laughs> and and do a Their sequel. Version. Yeah, and I said, well, what are you going to call it? And they said, the truth. <laughs> they, they, they said it didn't happen like I said it. And I said, well, it's the way I remember it. Yeah. And uh, it's just <laughs> just thinking back on the, the different stories, and it's always funny to me. And now I can't read it anymore. So mm-hmm. I'm looking forward to an audio book that I, I well let's let the audience know. I mean you I, you uh, are visually impaired right now, and this kind of just came about in the last couple of years. But the whole time growing up and all, we were all just balls to the wall. We was all fine back in them days. Yeah, we, yep. we could do it all, and we did it all pretty much. But. Uh, what happened here in, uh, um, like, was it a year or two ago? Or? Oh, with my eyes? Yeah. With oh, eyes. no, about eight years. Eight years. Oh. Yeah, I had, to, I had to quit work because I couldn't drive to work. Like on a foggy morning or, uh, <clears throat> you know, a rainy day, <laughs> I couldn't make it. So that was the end of that. But uh, Is it macular? No, it's, uh, it's glaucoma. Glaucoma. And they say that. Smoking a little reefer is probably good for it. I've always heard that. That's a damn lie. (laughs) (laughs) It just just ain't so. And I've talked to my doctors. I've been to 10 doctors. The Jacksonville Jaguar team eye doctors Mm. saved my eyes the last time I went to a different doctor. Mm -hmm. And they said, I'll get to keep what I got, hopefully. Oh, okay. So hopefully it won't get any worse. That's good. But, uh, I got hooked up with a, a a blind nonprofit outfit, and they, oh, the uh, visually impaired foundation of Georgia. It, and and they, this was just the other day. 
Well, it actually, it actually was a couple of years ago that I got hooked up with them, yeah. and it's just been a long process there. Okay. And it's slow, and, but they've helped me so much with tools and stuff. I even got – this is a walking cane I made, but they they got me a white cane that you see blind people with, mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. And, you, and you roll it left and right, and it's got a little marshmallow ball on the end that rolls, and, mm. it, and it's real light, and you just – Feeling for steps and stuff, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. and, and it's the cool. Everything they do is free. So the lady told me the other day, uh, I said, I had an idea if I painted some paintings of what I see, which certainly wouldn't be what anybody else sees. Uh, if I if I could sell them, and you could help market it, y'all could keep the money. And mm-hmm. she said, oh, no, that's a good idea. But you'll get to keep the money. But what we'll do is I'll make a website. And she says, something or other, something or other. And then I said, well, I got a book, too. She said, oh, really? She said, and she gave me the number of a, uh outfit in Atlanta. And I called this guy, and he said, we'll do an audio book for you. And we'll get professional. I'm laughing because I know what's written in that book. There's some, there's not some <laughs> there's good some ta- stuff in there. There's some cocktails in there. John John Wayne said, "Life ain't easy when you're stupid." You know, so <laughs> if you read that, you might just say, "Well, he's stupid," because that's some pretty rough stuff. But anyway, well, they're going to get a, a professional voice. Uh, reader to come in and read it. And I warned him. I said, hey, buddy. They'll probably get high just from reading it. <laughs> <laughs> but but they're doing it uh, for free. Yeah. They, they and and they're, it's for uh, for the blind. And mm-hmm. and anybody that can hear this or know somebody that's blind and got eye problems, they can get one for free. And this is not just for Georgia. It's for the whole United States. That's awesome. So, so uh that ought to get get your book out there. Yeah, there'd be a bunch of mad blind people. <laughs> <laughs> I might, might turn around. Might, you can't never tell about these things. Them, uh, them girls, ble- they, ain't, they ain't bleeding in, are they? Every now and then, but <laughs> okay, just a little just, ambience. Just a little uh, aesthetics go. for the podcast. Our wives are in the oil. Three of our wives are in the kitchen in there. <laughs> there, Dave. When we were coming on, cutting up and I hear him. <laughs> take, take this stick in there. <laughs> this is the stick that my buddy I'm in Wayne on the wall. <laughs> this this stick right here, my buddy Stork, who's in the book. He made that thing and cool. uh, did the whole nine yards, that's and that's good. my. Sunday go to meeting stick. Mallard. Too close. There you go. An old old stork can make anything from a a china cabinet. <laughs> from a china cabinet to a a this thing. <coughs> but we were talking when we came on the air. You asked me about my hat. I got a little pat. I got my hat on to keep the. That uh, patch what? says Okefenokee Swamp Park, Way Cross, Georgia. Is that from when you worked out there? Absolutely. And <laughs> and what I was going to tell you was that uh, your brother Tick was stationed in Cocoa Beach, and he said, James, come on down uh, when you get out of school and uh, spend the summer. And uh, I got us a apartment on that when you – you look out our front door, you're looking at the beach. And I, I went down there with you and rode the bus back. Okay. And uh, You told me that the other day, and I've forgotten it. I yeah. really had. I remember they had a clock on the wall in there that ran backwards, <laughs> which uh, well, what didn't I, help me any. What I remember was if you stood on our porch, you could see the beach if the guy in front of us opened his front and back door at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> it was a little white lie, Tick told me. But, but uh, <laughs> And that's where our, our good friends, which was neighbors when we were stationed in, in Albany at the trailer park, uh, our good friends, the Shores, we met uh, there. They were in the Marine uh, their daddy was in the Marine Corps, and they had transferred from Albany to Cocoa Beach. Well, and that's 
when I got introduced to them, I guess again, probably saw them on Dog Hill. I just can't remember. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But uh, he, I was out of money, out of gas, <laughs> out of hope, luck, whatever you want to call it. And he said, well, James, let's go fishing tomorrow. That was said, Brian. Yeah. Brian I, I Shore. Said, I ain't got nothing. So we go. He takes me out on the on these uh, jetties down there. And I, I had this little rod and reel and stuff. And uh, he's like a spider monkey going across them jetties going down there to the end. And I was trying to keep from busting my tail. And mm-hmm. I look up there. He's 100 yards ahead of me. And I look behind me, and water's starting to come over the jetties, like the tide had come up. And I was fixing to be landlocked out there. So <laughs> I, I holler at him, say, hey. And he 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 looked back at me, and he saw what was going on. So he passed me, and I was having trouble with the <laughs> rods and reels and tackle and stuff. And I said, hey, you got to take this. I got to hold on. And he said, No. And he just kept going. So I said, well, this is his stuff. So I just <laughs> left it in the ocean. <laughs> and, and, I, and I barely waited, waited across the jetties to get up there and, oh my God. and saw some guy had fell and cut his leg open. I mean, I was, I was glad to get out of there. Mm-hmm. So then we go to a bridge, and, uh, and I had this patch on a, on a shirt, like an army, mm-hmm. green army jacket. And... Uh, from when I worked at the swamp park. Well, I got up there and I caught a fish with like a Zebco 202, little cheapest mm-hmm. reel, and people started coming down there or was watching me. And some somebody saw that patch and they said, Oh, he's a professional. And I was just <laughs> hanging on. And that fish swam all over the place. And uh, finally, he, he gave up and just. If he'd have went by one of them uh, uh, posts, <clears throat> the more concrete pillars, mm-hmm. it'd have been over. He'd been gone. But anyway, we got him up there, and he was ten pounds, and and we didn't have no money to eat or nothing. So we go we go home. I clean this fish, and we fix start frying him. And my next door neighbor, who was a beach comber if they ever was one, <laughs> his wife worked. And he just bummed around. <laughs> and uh, he comes over and he says, hey, look, James, this is your mail. And I'm thinking, what are you doing with my mail? And he said, well, I knew you wasn't here, so I was going to save it for you. I opened it up. It was a letter from Billy Ray Aaron. Yeah. It was $10 cash in it. <laughs> and I was just like, the Lord answered the prayer. You know? <laughs> so, so uh I told Tick, uh, I don't know what happened, but we we back over at that. This is the point I was going to make about that. Uh, we go back to that guy's house, and he smoked pot like a chimney, and, <laughs> but his wife didn't know it. So we're sitting in the in the living room, and it had that big old shag green ugly carpet, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and uh, we're sitting there, and they were smoking air. And his wife come in unexpected, <laughs> and he said, "She said y'all smoking in there." And he said, "No, honey, we're not." You know, so she walks over there to the coffee table, and she picked up this stem, oh, no. and she yeah. says, "Well, what is this?" And he said, "That's a spider's leg." And she threw that thing up in there, <laughs> and the evidence was gone. Oh, that's a spider leg. But yeah, they couldn't find it in the green shag carpet. Yeah, it was gone. It was gone. But but right after that, the next morning, uh, I put two dollars worth of gas in the car, fixed the tire for two dollars, probably bought something for two dollars, and went back to Waycross. And <laughs> that was getting out of Cocoa Beach. That but, Brian Shore is, uh, and we're I mean, still friends of the family, you know. Uh, we had a reunion with the Shores probably about four or five years ago, the Griffins and the Shores. And uh, Brian is now a uh, pastor at a big church in Jacksonville. That's good. That's mm-hmm. good. And and your brother Tick, character in here, 
Yes. We, we won't want to say too much about him because he's a preacher now. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and three churches. Yeah. Yep. And he told me, he says, the re- I said, why you become a pe- preacher now? And he said, because I thought my mama would like it. I thought that was a pretty cool answer mm-hmm. huh. or something like that, you know. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. He's over three churches? <clears throat> yeah. Uh, started off How do you be two. three different places on Sunday? You move. Time. <laughs> Timeshare? Time. Timeshare, yeah, you call it that. He starts at about nine, does er- the earliest sermon at nine to what? 9.45 or so, and then he does the next one at 10 to something, and then the last one from 11 to 12. He said the first two churches like him because he's quick and gets out of there. <laughs> That's right. He probably does have to cut the sermon a little bit shorter at them two. But, yeah. uh, but we've been to see him. Yeah, yep. Yeah. We went a couple of times. He's my preacher. Yeah. <laughs> I hadn't he seen does him but a, one. does a great job. Of course, Gary's always – he's always been – uh, good with words. He's he he was the one that I thought would be the writer, but it turned out to be you. <laughs> well, you know when I when I did this and my guy uh, come along and helped me do some other stuff, mm-hmm. then I thought about you because you yeah. were doing the tale of the week, mm-hmm. and uh, I introduced you to him, and and, and that, that's that, where this came. Yeah, tale, the tale of the week. Dave tale got of his the week. Book printed up yeah, through that James was through you as well. That uh, kind of story about that in this this uh, episode's tale of the week. But uh, Lord have mercy. Well, why don't you just tell some other stories? <laughs> what about uh, okay, when I met James? Big cock charters. Yeah, yeah. Tell, tell us about that. Well, because that it started. <laughs> The boys would come to me. I have three grown sons, and they came to me and said, we want to do a fishing charter thing. Would you help us financially, you know, help us get it started? And I said, no. (laughs) And then I thought about it, and I said, yeah. So uh, I said, well, what are we going to call it? And they said, Big Cock Charters. (laughs) And I said, no, no. And they said, well, we'll have a rooster because a rooster is a cock with a fishing rod. And and so uh, they convinced me and we... Y'all had merchandise and T-shirts? Yeah, well, what happened was... the Pull that up, Justin. Big Cock. There's a a yellow bio. And there's also that. That's fine. That's fine for starters. Okay, go ahead. Well, uh, when when we started, the same month after they got their captain's license and we started doing boat charters in the flats down below Tallahassee in the Gulf of Mexico, the Gulf oil spill happened out there in New mm. Orleans. So, mm. And people would say, you know, we'd say, hey, you want to go fishing? they say, how's the oil? <laughs> <laughs> there wasn't any oil within hundreds of miles of us, but. Yeah. It was a perception. So mm-hmm. I thought, well, good gosh, got all this money in here and nobody wants to fish. And uh, so they said, let's do a T-shirt. So we did a T-shirt and it was Big Cock Charters and had the, the, old, the old, uh, rooster on the boat. And, and that- then people would say, well, what about? hunting you know and so then we had to do a hunting one then a racing <laughs> then a motorcycle we did a whole all kind of <laughs> and sold a bunch and spent Cock a bunch. of every color yeah <laughs> this is the one that i like i i had never seen this but it says uh this is kind of like their uh their uh manifesto cock it's our name yeah wayne cock senior which is james's daddy was gifted with athleticism, good looks, and the ability to fix anything. He was an outdoorsman, a Southern gentleman, and an all-American kind of guy. These qualities earned him the nickname Lucky. Unfortunately, he passed on at the very young age of 33, leaving many to wonder, was he really lucky? Now it's up to Lucky the rooster to carry on his legacy. (laughs) Uh, There's a picture of his uh, daddy. 
a couple of pictures of his daddy in there too. Uh, uh, I guess one of them is called Lucky Cock. Uh, <laughs> uh, That's a good name right there. Yeah. There we go. That's him right there in the f center of the picture on the ground there. I think he's got a watch on. I can't see it, but I remember. Yeah, yeah. yeah he's got a wrist watch on his left arm. Who, what football player is going to play with a watch on? <laughs> <laughs> that was just picture day. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Looks like a stud. And who was this now, the team? The Leon. Uh, uh, Tallahassee High School or yeah. something, Leon County. I remember when Leon High came up to Valdosta to play him in football, the PA announcer from Valdosta Wildcats says, we'd like to welcome all you Leon Lions coming up from Tallahassee, the number one school in the state of Florida and wins. And they all cheered. And then he says, and hosting here today is the Valdosta Wildcats, the number one leading team in the nation in victory. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they outdone them. <laughs> and there's a picture of your daddy uh, at a at a, uh, a barbecue, a re uh, picnic, or something at somebody's house, and uh, he's waving at the camera. He looks he looks a lot like you right there. I never noticed the similarities. I don't think I had ever seen this picture till I copied it and saved it. And this would have been close to about the time that he passed, I guess. Yep, yep. yep. And you don't remember him at all because you were. I remember. I uh, remember. Three or so? I was four. Four. And I remember him whipping my brother's tail <laughs> for chasing a rooster. We had a, some chickens. And, mm -hmm. I, that's, and I remember going to, like, we was members of a country club or something, you know, and redneck. <laughs> Andalusia, Alabama, and there was some Appaloosa horses. I remember seeing them every time we'd go out there swimming and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, that's all I remember. Mm, that's your early memory. Yeah, yeah. it ain't much. And, uh, uh, picture of your mama in there, too. She was an Army nurse. R r well, actually, she spent time in Korea, didn't she? Uh, no. No? I don't think so. Uh, I, I, I do have a first cousin that husband, just oddity. He was worked for GE, and she went over to South Korea and uh, worked here lately. But her brother, that's her brother, James Edward, he was killed in Korea by a sniper after the Korean War was over. So, mm. yep, so that's the, the Korea uh, connection there, but uh, and, and I was your, named for him. Pretty mama, yes, Edie. Pretty. Yeah, we had pretty mamas. We sure <laughs> did. I said uh, they were. Uh, uh, I, I always remember Edie. You know, just uh, at that age. Well, not that age, but a little bit older than that. In the in the fifties, and we were living right next door to y'all. Yep. Uh, yep. Well, um, is there a few more pictures there where we left off in chronological is childhood? I think the next one might be the back, backyard basketball. Mm -hmm. There's a picture of me with the ball fixing the hook shot. We nailed that big old piece of plywood up on that pine tree, or somebody did, weren't us. I it, don't think. It was us. It was? Yeah. It looks mighty tall <laughs> right there. We had, I guess the angle of the photographer. Got well, a lighter. I'll, I'll tell you this. When you were saying that we played football down in the pasture, we played soccer. Four, four soccer was popular. We, we played baseball. baseball, softball, and uh, a little of everything. And uh, That was the basketball court, the, the uh, shelter right there. Uh, had concrete floor and it kind of uh, eased down into the yard, uh, probably about three foot drop, kind of sloped right down to the yard where it would just kind of ran out. And the, and the that's other, what we dribble on. <laughs> is that the other thing that we did? We had a skateboard. So you see these people oh, skateboarding. Really? Mm -hmm. We was doing it in nineteen sixty sixty two. Did y'all like. make it or? Well, no, my my. 
my little granny, she uh, ordered it out of a S and H green stamp book. <laughs> she saved her stamps. When you buy groceries, they you'd yeah. fill up a little book, and you'd redeem it for different things. Who got hurt on that? Uh, do what now? Did anybody get hurt? No, because <laughs> we was having such a good time with it. Finally, one day out there, all, way, all three got on it. Mm, and broke it, it. When it broke, that was the end of the skateboarding days. Mm. That probably saved our mm. lives right there. <laughs> Boy, we had so many good times in that backyard right there. Uh, that shelter right there had the coolest well water. There's a pump, well pump, right at the front end of the shelter in a little pump house. And that uh, big old red table bench back there that you clean fish on, big old uh, sink basin, and a faucet right on top of that sink. With the coldest water, we'd be playing out there in that pasture on hot, hot days and take a break and the shade of that, uh, the pine tree shaded that shelter right there, so it stayed cool, and the water was cool. We was playing football out there one day. I don't want to tell a bunch of them stories, but this was one that uh, there was old boy. He was going in the, I think he was going in the Marines in like a couple of days, and and uh, slick punted a football down there, and I tackled him, and it was. You know, I hit him about the time the ball got there, but it wasn't no killer, nothing. And he got up and he said, oh, Lord, my leg. He says, my leg is popped out of joint. Well, y'all. That's what the story I was we, thinking we, about. y'all pop that thing back in joint in, in the socket? And <laughs> we said, yeah. So we all took turns snatching on his leg. And so finally we <laughs> moved up to a sliding board. And he grabbed hold of the sliding board po post. And we snatched on that thing, and it never would go. So we moved up to the shelter right there. And, oh, Lord. Uh, and he got he laid down right by that post right there in that picture. And mm. and we snatched, took turns snatching. Well, long story short, his leg was broke. Oh, God. And, and he was a man. He had to, he had to yeah. de be delayed going in the Marines, but he later went. He sure did. He probably oh. told that story to them, too, in the Marines. And they said, then we'll go ahead and make you a general right now. <laughs> <laughs> if you can stand that kind of pain. Yep. Uh, what's next on there, buddy? <clears throat> okay, we jumped fast forward into high school. This would have been about 70, 70, 70, 1970, the uh, spring of 1970 tennis team. Uh, where County High School had just a couple of years had a tennis team by this time. And there's, and oh, but fast uh, backtrack a little bit. Uh, two years, about 68, James had moved off to Andalusia. Is that right? That's right. Andalusia, Alabama. And uh, uh, he moved away from Dog Hill. And so, uh, when he came back a year or so later, he came back with the game of tennis. And, uh, you know, we were sports-minded always. So he said, guys, I've got a new game that I learned, <laughs> and it's tennis. And so we'd play right over here at Monroe Park. Uh, and, and is that where that photo is at? No, that's the courts out at uh, uh, Ware County. So the, the courts have been there that long? They they were Monroe dead. Park. Yeah. Oh, they've been there for a long time. Yeah, they they've been there since probably the twenties or something. You reckon? Wow. Yeah, I mean, Waycross always had a high school tennis team. Mm. Mm -hmm. But they they yeah, I don't know the answer to that. But uh, there's James in the upper left hand corner of this picture, strumming his racket like Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> <laughs> And that set a trend because the years following in the annuals, the, you had others like Billy Reeves copping the same pose. <laughs> and uh, James was a magnificent athlete. Now, he played high school football and I, tennis. And I 
But he I, taught us all. I fought hard. That's all I did. I well, hit shots out my behind and stuff like that, but it wasn't easy. I wasn't a smooth athlete, you know, like a lot of. No, folks. but you, 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 uh, you duped your uh, opponent. They, they size you up. You know how you size people up, you know, before the games, before you set foot on the court. They look across there and say, "Oh, I'm playing him. I got this," <laughs> you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, you were you were a football player build. You had a football player's build. Well, at Weir County, when you finish <laughs> football, I was fixing to uh, go to like 101 drinking. And <laughs> we had a new coach out there named Phil Early. And he said anybody that plays sports has to play two sports. And so that messed me up. So uh-huh. uh, I wasn't going to run. I wasn't going to run track. <laughs> so that's for sure. And I wasn't going to go on the baseball team because that's all they did was running. And like I said, I was a senior, and I wanted to drink. Right. So, so what would you do? Uh, then uh, they said, no, nope, you got to do something. And I said, well, what's left? And they said, tennis. I said, I- uh-oh. That's all right. That's well, all right. It's, it's pouring. It's pouring. Oh. Oh, and to some electricity. Uh-oh. Wait a minute. We'll take a short break, folks. We'll be right back. Something in my brain won't let me stray. Something in my veins gonna find its way. Something in the water taught me how to pray. We're back. Uh, sorry to uh, alarm anybody, but uh, there were no Pine Box dwellers injured in that uh, <laughs> incident. So, uh, all right, James, where were you? <laughs> well, when I when I went to Alabama, uh, I moved in a neighborhood, and there was three guys there. So, and they all liked tennis, so I just fit right in, and uh, and that's how I became a tennis player. Mm-hmm. And w- we were right down the river right down the road from the Conoco River, and I see the Conoco sausage in Walmart everywhere, and mm-hmm. I, I, I like that sausage. <laughs> <laughs> but it, And it brings back memories. <laughs> but uh, I came to Waycross and introduced these fellas, and we t- moved over here to Monroe Park and started playing and met a lot, you know, that's met a lot of people, Mal Jenkins and Billy Reeves and, Andy Cuneo, I believe, was another one, and mm-hmm. uh, had some killer matches with them. Uh, do you remember meeting them that day, Dave? Uh, not in particular people. Like, I mean, Mal Jenkins. Yeah, I remember Mal because he was such a he was he was a good tennis player. He was one of the good ones. Well, when I was trying to teach y'all, mm-hmm. they were sitting over there laughing and. Mocking us and stuff. <laughs> so, so I don't know if it was Roy Ray or who, but they said James will beat all y'all, and I d- didn't want to get into that, you know. <laughs> and so next thing you know, it was a five dollar bet. So and uh, so they said okay, and so I was going to play. I don't know which one of them I was going to play, uh, and. <laughs> <laughs> and they said it was five dollars. And the, the reason I'm laughing is because when we started playing, I said, "Wait just a minute. Which one of you boys has got five dollars in case in case I win? Well, you ain't gonna win. You know that's what they were saying. And so <laughs> it don't matter whether but, we got money or not. You ain't winning. And so come to find out, they didn't nobody have money. So one of them had to go home and bring back five dollars. And I luckily beat whoever it was. And <laughs> That hushed them up, but <laughs> that was our introduction to Monroe Park. And mm-hmm. Lord, we played many a night into the night there. You'd put a dime in the little light timer, turn them lights on, play on. That was it. That was it. Uh, what's next, Justin? Let's roll through these last chronological pictures there and see what memories it sparks. Uh, 
I mean, we really don't need pictures to spark a memory. You got so many. Well, there's another we uh, just solo need, picture of James. Just need to keep scrolling on. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I can say. Uh, okay, this is the snowstorm of 73. It says on the picture there, I guess that's the development date. Got them pictures developed in March of 73. So it probably happened right right around then. Yep, yep. Yeah, that's us in your backyard in front of the old pack house down there. That was the clubhouse. Uh, me and James standing there. We sent this picture to Tick, who was stationed in Cornwall, England, hmm. at the time in the Air Force, and said, "Don't don't tell them what we said." <laughs> snow on the ground and uh, and uh, love in our hands. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Somebody. Oh, here we go. You were a Pee Wee football coach for the. Uh, Memorial Drive Wildcats in 72? Oh, I was, was it, about 15 years. So so it started, though, this picture would have been about, that's Kills, you on the right, Kills second from you. In between there, it looks like uh, Terry Dowling. Was he a coach? No. Uh, no. It was uh, Daniel Tyre. Daniel Kills. Tyre. And Tommy James. Okay. And Tommy okay. James, when I first went to Memorial Drive, his little boy was 10 years old and fixed to move up to the midgets the next year. And so I taught him into staying down with helping me because old Billy Ray got sent off to the Army. That's and, right. It was you and Billy Ray. Yeah. I remember in the stadium coaching a football game, and I, uh, we had just won the game, and – a big giant plane flew over the stadium, and one one of them little peewees says, "Bye, Coach Heron." <laughs> <laughs> I won't never forget that. <laughs> but then, so Ray was gone. He was, we wasn't coaching together no more. So the guy on the left, Tommy James, he worked at the railroad, and he didn't know much about football, but I taught him as best I could, and mm -hmm. he stayed with me and. I coached and he handled the, the parents. You know, <laughs> that was the that one was, of the hardest things. Oh my gosh. And he did the equipment. His cousin was Benny James at the sports shop. Mm -hmm. So we got it's all our Ken equipment. Michael James. Yeah, Michael James's uncle. We got all our equipment cheap because they were cousins. And so, but anyway, uh, then was the good old days. Yeah. If I could see the. Who's this kid right here with no shirt on in the background? Yeah, he's somebody without a shirt on way back there. Just Has he got a helmet on? No, he's just okay. he's a bystander. That's his hair. Like, yeah. yeah. You know, he's I, got his back to the camera. That's funny. But, I, hey, pull it up close again. And far left there, I think. All right, now go to the left. No, that's not David Shields over there. No, this um, is that boy's name. Scotty Kaler right there in the middle. Dwayne Sapp was there. There was a Leslie Heron. Gosh, a mighty Timmy, somebody. Who was the little boy that you used to have to carry to your house and sweat him? In the, in the, you'd get take him in the bathroom and turn the hot water on so it would steam up. <laughs> Look here, we can't talk about stuff like that. <laughs> and no, I, he was one of the star players, but he was a tad overweight. Yep, or he tended to be. Oh, Cecil Pittman. Cecil Pittman. I remember <laughs> go over to your house and there'd be the bathroom just be pouring out fog. <laughs> that we, little boy in there trying to. Show, what, show, Trying to work the weight off of him. <laughs> One of the stories I tell about that, we was at the stadium, and every Saturday morning you'd have to take your players and weigh them in, and the opposing coach had to be there. So you little fellas, they would just walk in there with their uniforms on and step on the scale and keep it going. <laughs> but the big boys at the end of the line, they had, everything to, they had to strip down. And so uh, my, old buddy, <laughs> my old buddy Cecil uh, – he stripped down to his his took his shoes and socks off, helmets, everything but his pants. And I said, Cecil, you got 
and it, that, that that weight thing was just barely, you know, it didn't make it. I said, mm. you got to go in there and take your pants off and get down to your drawers. <laughs> he said, no, coach. And I said, you got to. And he said, no, coach. So I take him back there in the bathroom, just me and him. And I said, you got to get down to your drawers. He said, I ain't got on any drawers. <laughs> <laughs> so we made everybody leave, but me and the... The other coach, <laughs> he got a, he got butt naked and got on there, but he was a he was a hell of a football player. <laughs> oh, uh, David Shields, the athletic director out at Ware County, then was and and Todd Veal and there was just a lot of good mm-hmm. players. Ori McRae and Ori McRae, yeah, he was a Memorial Drive boy, yes, sir. but not really? on this team. This, I, this wasn't my first team. Okay, but he was a Memorial Drive boy. Yes, sir. Well, shoot. I see him when I play my gigs over there in St. Simons. He's, he's, <laughs> he lives at the uh, Sea Palms Golf Right, right. Course. Will you tell him I said, hey, when I you see I will. Him? I didn't realize oh, that. Oh, that's uh, – or, uh, Ari McRae. Glasses. Uh, he's, a, he's a runner. Yeah. Yeah, he and, his wife. he and his wife both went to high school no, over th- here, Ware County High School. And uh, uh, they were probably uh, late 70s to early 80s graduates, probably. Right, right. Uh, anyhow, how about that? I'll if, have to mention that to him. If I could get closer and all that, there's a little Bennett boy, Bruce Bennett's boy down in the Who's middle. There's a little redheaded guy on the front row. That's Bruce Bennett's little boy. I, I, I named him, what was his nickname? <laughs> Killer. 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 <laughs> yeah. I'm pretty sure that was his nickname. And uh, there's a preacher right there next to him. Or yeah. somewhere. Anyway, I can't keep up with him. What uh, elementary or Memorial, Memorial Drive? Drive? That's Memorial Drive? Uh-huh. Wow. That, that, I don't remember those colors. We, I, I went to Memorial Drive. We was uh, red and silver. Yeah, kind of had a tendency to change though, over the decades. Even the names of the mascots would change, you know. Yeah. The William Heights are no longer the Indians anymore. No, I think they changed to something else. They had to get away. The, the Rattlers were that color. Uh, what were they? Uh that Rattlers? Was Purple that, and, and yellow. Was that McDonald Street? Or? Yeah, that's exactly who they were. The Rattlers? Yeah, we played them for years and mm. wore them out. And, mm. uh... <laughs> yeah, uh, Wacona Hornets or Yellow Jackets? Hornets. Wacona was Hornets. Yep. What about Emerson Park? Martins? No, no that, that Martins was, uh, was Wisebur. Uh, yeah. Martins. But, 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 yeah. I was I was playing old DJ Brown at the Alice Street Eagles one year, and me and Diane was out and about late at night, and we got caught for speeding and whatever. And the state patrol took my license, and so uh, back then they just let you go home with no license. And so wow. uh, the next morning I called DJ and I said, "Can you get my license back?" And he said, "Yes, I can, but." Uh, the next three or four times we scrimmage, you're gonna scrimmage at our place. And so I said, okay. So we went to, we went and scrimmaged him and when we shook hands, that license was in my hand. And after three or four times my parents were saying, Why come we always over here? <laughs> you say, I'm gonna I'm gonna do something about that. No, no, I I said it it helps us. Like to travel, you know. <laughs> I come up with some bull crap. <laughs> All right. But, uh, hey, oh boy. Now, this picture was taken uh, the morning after. Uh, that's uh, me on the right, Billy Ray next to me. Uh, <laughs> the two of us had a band called Sweetbriar, and we had just played the night before in uh, the Cabaret Club in Jessup. And that's James in the red and white athletic shirt. That's Tick, my brother Gary, sitting down, and one of his Air Force buddies who came. Uh, see, that was after 
uh, after Tick returned from England. That's when this was kind of a reunion, and we played in uh, April of 75, the night before there over in Jessup. And, uh, I, I still got one of them sweet buyer shirts. And yeah. I don't think it'll fit me anymore. <laughs> that old green hunk of metal back there was a Volkswagen van belonged to Ray. And uh, nice. Yeah, my, and my brother used to hang around a band just like I hung around y'all. His was, he hung around the Rites. Do you remember <laughs> yeah, them? The Rites, you sure do. I sure do. But, so. <clears throat> uh, Okay, here's the fa famous Sensamilla board game. <laughs> oh, Lord. It, wasn't it designed by you? No, actually. It was not your idea? We, we, we was all, me and Ray and Becky, and I don't remember, it, I don't who else, but I remember it was a cops and robber kind of uh, game, like, chance and uh -huh. it, it, you got busted and it was it was a, a pod oriented game and you'd go backwards and, you know like go to jail mm -hmm. and all like but monopoly the, but the winner went to the airport <laughs> and whoever got to the airport and got out of there they was they was the winner <laughs> but we lost the cards <laughs> but this game uh i wound up with it and we used to play it. I'd let a lot of people, not just our neighborhood, a lot of people come and party, and we'd play this game, and uh, <laughs> I lost it. And 50 years later, I was going through a pack house, and <laughs> in the back corner of the pack house, in the bottom box, there it was. <laughs> and so I, I took it to a printer there in Valdosta, and uh, had that printed, and that's a duplicate. I sent the original back to Ray because Becky Drew did it. the artwork on mm -hmm. it. And uh, so I thought that'd be a cool, you know, thing for nowadays. Folk art. Yeah. Mm. You know, something that's 50 years ago mm -hmm. and maybe sell the prints or something. Well, I never could get nothing going. <laughs> it was just another, <laughs> another one of my loony ideas. But I thought it was cool because cool. it was colorful and, mm -hmm. you know, it could be framed. and. Mm -hmm. but, <laughs> but, yeah. That was, we need to move on from yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay, this is 1998 at the first Griffin Guitar Pool Thanksgiving weekend, which ended up turning into the Grand Parsons Guitar Pool now in its 25th year. But this was an opportunity for the Dog Hill Gang to re reunion with one another in 1998, and that's what we looked like then. <laughs> that's James, Gary, Billy Ray, me, and Greg. Or if you're going by the, uh, by the book. nicknames, Sharky, Tick, Bird Legs, Lonesome, and Slick. Don't don't make <laughs> don't make Ray mad now. <laughs> he, he never liked that. Bird name. Leg Ray. Yeah. Bird Leg Ray. <laughs> All right. Now the next one will be a little. Uh, yeah, this was in 2015. Without Tick, we got together for a quick reunion over at Billy Ray's house. So there's. Uh, James, Billy Ray, Greg, and myself. And that was over actually on Dog Hill. Yep, at the end. The dog leg around to Central Avenue there. All right. Moving right along. Now, this is 2010, and James right there, third from the left, <clears throat> was a uh, member of the Valdosta team that uh, represented Valdosta in the uh, United States Tennis Association, Georgia State Championships, and they damn sure won the thing. Mm. Well, I, I had a buddy over in Valdosta when I moved over there, and it just so happened we hit it off, and he was the best player in town. So I, me and him became good friends and partners, and so I always tell everybody, I, me and him can beat anybody. As long as he's over there, <laughs> but and everybody was kind of used to get 
kind of aggravated with him because he wouldn't play with nobody else. But we won a lot of state championships together, and uh, the the team around us changed mm-hmm. somewhat. But we had one captain for all them years, and uh, when I lost my right eye. We had already sent our name into the tournament, and we had already won some matches, and they go Mm year-round. And the the championship match was in Bainbridge, and I didn't have an eye. So I wasn't going to be a starter. We always had a sub, and so I was going to sit that one out. But I had to play one match to qualify to go on to, like, New Orleans or wherever we were Mm -hmm. going on to. And uh, so I had to play with one. One eye, and so uh, we won the match, and it was lucky. And uh, I, I, I won't get into the tennis of it, but we, me and my partner, played in the I. I am going to get into it. <laughs> we played in the eye <laughs> formation, so I would cover his backhand, but I'd be in the middle of the court, and so when he would serve over to that backhand side the normal shot is across court. Mm-hmm. So this guy couldn't shoot that because I was there, but I had only one eye and I was afraid he's going to try me out. And so they didn't know that. Though. They didn't know that. So yeah. finally, after he got frustrated and we was kicking their butt, he <laughs> drills one at me and, and I just put my racket up and he had a partner about as close to me to Sean and that guy was standing in front of me and that thing hit the sweet spot in my racket and it went right toward his uh, private area, <laughs> and that fella never moved, and it went right in the crack, in the crease, and went past him, and that guy's eyes was big as saucers, and uh, <laughs> and so they never tried that again. So I was so thankful. Oh, it. my gosh. Wow. Fortune smiles. <laughs> yeah, that was, that, was a, that was a lucky shot. <laughs> Well, it, it just goes back to, number one, it's a testament to your talent on the tennis court. Your and sharkiness. I shark, want, his his sharkiness. <laughs> <laughs> if I played now, I'd have to get a racket about that big around. <laughs> but, uh, but I will say this about tennis. You hear people playing golf and doing this and that. Uh, but tennis, when I first started, Back in Andalusia, a can of tennis balls was two dollars, and when I quit playing uh, about eight years ago, a can of tennis balls was two dollars, and I just don't know of anything else wow. that hadn't gone That's up maintained. in fifty years. How but, about that? And I, I can tell you something else: musicians' wages. Yeah, that hadn't gone up. That's what I was going to say. That's like carpenters. <laughs> I had an old uncle that was a contractor, and he said. Carpenters build the world, and they make minimum wage. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just sorry. But, uh, well, uh, let's roll this. Uh, oh, okay. I forgot we had that. That's the thing. I was a uh, wannabe artist in the uh, early 70s, about 72, right out of high school. I dabbled with pastel chalks and all. I took a course. I ain't as, as talented an artist as, as Sean is, but uh, in in 72, I was thinking, well, maybe I can do something with it because I like to take album covers, existing album covers, and not trace it, but Look at it. eye it and uh, actually reconstruct it just by looking at it, you know. Which I guess is what artists do with, Mm -hmm. you know, real life, you know. But Mm -hmm. I was doing it just using already, you know, somebody else's artwork and trying to duplicate it best I could. Well, in this class, the art class I took, they said, set you up some, you know, some things, you know, around the house. And uh, and then just sit it up and paint it. And and I did one with an old uh, Bible and shotgun and... uh, some melatonin. <laughs> no, it's a spinning wheel planter, a Bible, an old flat iron from the grandma's the 1800s, and, uh, and and a shotgun and gave it to mama. And then I did this collage right here. I grabbed one of the M- Moral Drive Wildcat football helmets, a cleat, 
And James smoked Winston's at the time. <laughs> yep, yep. So I put a pack of Winston's in the shoe <laughs> and a football on the tee. And that uh, newspaper clipping says Memorial Drive Blanks Bulldogs or something like that. <laughs> and the, the subtitle, I think it said Memorial Drive uh, wins first tilt in three years. In other words, my first year – Got there, they hadn't won a game in two years. Good gracious! And so, but I had David Shields and Todd Ville and Ori and all them you had, boys. You had a team. So they just needed whipping in shape. Yep. And when they, <laughs> but I knew what I had when I when I went out there. Mm-hmm. But uh, <laughs> uh, speaking of art here, uh, you want to address that painting behind you? Yeah, yeah, folks. This uh, painting right here is my granddaughter's artwork from about three years ago, three or four years ago. You want me to get it down? No, I got it. You got it? It's right there in the frame there. Um, my wife, Lynn, she's she's an artist, and uh, she drew an old folky uh, painting of four dogs on a board, four cartoon dogs with psychedelic colors all over them and called it the dog eel gang (laughs) which was us (laughs) sharky tick slick and uh myself and uh we were the original four anyhow and uh and my uh, granddaughter hannah was about seven years old and saw uh saw grant grandma's uh rendition she said i want to do my painting of the dog hill gang so that's what resulted right there it was pretty crafty super cool, super cool. <laughs> she's a good artist she's a good little artist still I, is i always wanted to do a t-shirt <clears throat> well know. we should we should do make a t-shirt out of either one that that one or uh lens either one either we one should. we could do that well, let's do a tale of the week right here. Uh, <clears throat> ain't worth a damn. <laughs> oh, no. Don't tell that one. <laughs> All right. Yes. There it is. Hickory Wind Music Store. James Cott, our guest today. In this picture, James Cock sat in Hickory Wind Music Store, smiling at all the friends, family, and curiosity seekers who had come to hear a story or buy an autographed copy of his self-published book, Cocktails, Memoirs of a Redneck Hippie. I was reminded of a summer afternoon growing up on Dog Hill when James, along with my brother Gary and I, sat in James's back porch bedroom, hammering out the words of a certain bestseller, the sequel to Savage Sam, a 1963 movie we'd just got back from watching downtown at the old Ritz Theater. Even then, we dreamed like poets. I hold my old childhood friend, next-door neighbor, and Valdosta, Georgia book author James Cock responsible for turning me into a full-time blogger for two and a half years. He messaged me on Facebook at 9.01 p.m. July 18th, 2016, with a simple question. Did you ever think about a blog? To which I replied unemotionally, nope. (laughs) That's true. That's not exactly true, because I had considered writing a memoir of sorts, even going as far as committing six or seven paragraphs to two chapters of a book that never got beyond August 3rd, 2015. So when I read James's question, I thought to myself, I ain't got time to write a blog. And I do stay fairly occupied writing songs when the muse visits occasionally, planning and putting on two yearly music events, uh, playing solo gigs around and about the Southeast, But over that next week, James's words kept muddling around in the back of my mind until finally I decided that I did have something to say, stories to tell, and musical history to impart. Growing up the son of a 20-year Air Force serviceman whose travels took the family over to Tripoli, Libya, when I was a tadpole of four, only to have my 
1959 Christmas Day cowboy outfit hand peeled and stolen off my body by five dastardly Arab boys. There's a story. Playing in a traveling United, playing and traveling to the United States in a nightclub band, Eddie Middleton and Down Home throughout the mid 70s, whereupon I would meet and party with Dickie Betts as he picked my old Takamini acoustic guitar in my bedroom at the Courtesy Court Motel in Macon. Another good one. So, six days after my old friend suggested I blog, I sat down on July 24th and I did. I did blog about a husband and wife songwriting team out of Moultrie, Georgia, who made the big time with hit songs recorded by the Everly Brothers, Roy Orbison, Graham Parsons, Emmy Lou Harris, and a who's who of musical greats. And it felt good. I settled on a name for the blog, intentionally misspelling the words tale of the week and started up an Uncle Dave's Tale of the Week Facebook page. After a month or so of steady blogging, I realized that the domain I'd purchased for my festival websites had built-in blog templates, enabling me to insert pictures, add tags, and schedule for details to hit the Internet. Three months later, it was James again, lobbying for my brother Gary, managing editor of the Waycross Journal Herald, to run a Tale of the Week column in the local newspaper. After the first year and a half of weekly blogs, James, I see a pattern evolving here, emailed me the address of Mike Orenduff, a sure enough writer of Murder Mysteries and most recently the chief editor of Achenbach and Kent Publishing. Mr. Orenduff offered to publish James's forthcoming book, Margaret B. Long, The Jewel of Jacksonville a collection of his Aunt Margie's Florida Times Union newspaper columns from the 40s and 50s. Orrin Duff also extended me a book publishing contract for Tale of the Week after reading several of my stories. After quoting from James Cox Tales in <laughs> Sorry. After quoting from James's cocktails in one of my blogs, he responded by saying, Dave, you amazed me with your work. I enjoyed seeing my little part in the whole scheme of things. Because it was his part in the whole scheme of things in 2016 that inspired me to open my mind and write about my memories. So it is my hope that readers may find a little bit of enjoyment, some trivial enlightenment, or maybe a tear of nostalgia in my stories. If so, that makes me mighty happy. If not, then it's his fault. <laughs> well, I, I know who the writer is in the, in the room. So I, I will say this about cocktails. The lady that uh, offered to, Publish my book for five hundred dollars to publish it, and five hundred dollars to edit it. And she, I told her, "No, I can't do that. I can't afford that. I'm a poor fella." She said, "Well, I tell you what, I'll do. I'll uh, publish it for five hundred dollars, and then I'll edit it in my sleep because I can. I'm an old English teacher." And I said, "Well, you might not like it." And she said, "Listen, I'm a staunch." Uh, liberal, don't worry about me liking your book. And I said, oh, great. So she started and started <laughs> editing it, and when she, everything was fine on Dog Hill. But when she got into my college years where I run into some illicit stuff, mm -hmm. she, she started getting mean and nasty in her emails. <laughs> and, and, and she told me, she said, look, uh, I lost a sister to crack and a sister uh, to heroin, ooh. and I'm not looking at all this anymore. And I said, "Well, look, don't don't quit on me." I said, "I, I didn't stay right there, and I, you know I moved on in my life and keep on." She said, "Okay," so she stayed on, but her emails kept getting meaner and meaner. And finally, she, she sent me an email 
or she mm-hmm. told me on the phone, she said, listen, uh, if you were smart, you'd walk away from this. <laughs> And I said, look, I, I never said I was smart. <laughs> but, but keep on. Don't quit on me, you know. So she kept on, and she got meaner and meaner. And finally, one, one day I went out at the mailbox, and there was a $500 check right sitting there. She she was through with me. She didn't give you money back. She did give me my money back, and she said, you don't owe me nothing. She done a lot and helped me a lot. You know, oh, so, okay, so she didn't publish it, but she edited it. Yeah, for about half of it. Yeah. And, and so, okay, yeah. So I, she I washed her a, hands of it. I had an old football high school player I had coached over, and and he became a lawyer in Valdosta, and he and he saw my uh, problem, and he contacted a dean at at Valdosta State University, and I contacted that guy, and he says. Hell no, I ain't doing this. You know, I ain't got time. I'm dean of mm-hmm. English over here. So I left, and two days later, he called me and says, I can't turn a blind man down. He said, I, I'll just edit it on my breaks and stuff. And mm-hmm. uh, and when I can, just don't get in any hurry. Mm-hmm. Make a real long story short, he did it. Mm-hmm. And uh, I talked to him on an email the other day. He was checking on me. And... Uh, and uh, the bottom line is, he said, James, I, I hadn't told anybody, but I used to take your book in w- when I was doing a little teaching and use your book as how to teach how to write a memoir. So my book's been to college. Wow. That's, how about that? It, it's crazy. Look at that. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> but, but he told me, he said, mm. he said, I'd be working and carrying on and doing my job. And he said, I got to have a break. I'm going to go see what James is up to now. And so, <laughs> so he, but it took him a year. But anyway, we, I had a big time with it. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, that was awesome. But but the real writer, I know, is sitting right here and Love songwriter that. and all Shit. that. I'll tell you, our uh, Tick is the real writer. <laughs> he, he absolutely is he a great is. writer. He's a great writer. And uh, he is now without. Uh, without the vocation of managing editor because the paper shut down. Uh, been that way for years now. And, and all this uh, from Dog Hill. Yeah. All, all these writers. It's because we dreamed big. Don't dream big. <laughs> well, it's like so, I was saying in that first paragraph, we did. We'd go to the movies and come home and get on the back porch and just think, let's write a book. <laughs> I, I wonder. And it would be the exact same plot as the movie we'd just seen. <laughs> I wonder how many neighborhoods throughout the United States had neighbors, you know, that had similar experiences, you know. I don't know if they had as much as we did, James, so I the swear. Odd, the odds of, uh, you know, three or four people uh, writing at any capacity like that uh, has to be pretty low, you know. Yeah. Even the desire to write. Well, I'm thinking even, well, I'm thinking even deeper than that. I think we had a bond yeah. that was, that was, uh, more unique than, than a lot of other neighborhoods because I think other neighborhoods kind of came and went, you know, as far as you'd have a group here, okay, and then they'd filter off or move away or whatever happened. But we always, we always came back to that that formative time. Those from probably sixty four, maybe a little sooner. But when we moved back for good in sixty four and spent that whole year in Waycross, that's where it all kind of synced for me. It seems like that's when we were getting a little bit older and. Uh, now all we need is a screenwriter to. Write some, but it does some stuff for your book and my book, and mm-hmm. bring it to the big screen. Um, sure. Yeah. My so son's they, getting into that, but he's he likes horror movies. He's trying he's trying to write would, horror movies. That would be us. Y'all could uh, we could use y'all stories, but we can incorporate zombies or something. Dog Hill Resurrection. Slasher. Oh, oh slasher Lord. on Dog Hill. Oh Lord. Oh Lord. Werewolf. This is the big one. 
Last, last house on Dog Hill. Oh, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can call it uh, what you want to, uh, horror <laughs> stories or idyllic dream. I think it was everything wrapped up into one. We had the, in my opinion, we had one of the greatest childhoods ever, and it was right there at the edge of Waycross, just over the county line, uh, close enough that we were, you know, close enough to downtown where you could get in the car and be downtown in five minutes. The good and, old uh, days. Yeah. Uh, well, I'll say this, and you didn't really mention it much, but I know music was always circular. That music was a big part of Dog Hill. When I, when I was... Not so much us playing it, but listening right, to it. that's what I'm talking about, how it impacted, you know, Well... I had a little transistor radio that I'd listen to the radio under the covers, you know, listen to the AM yes, station. We, I think we all did that. And yeah. then it, when the Beatles came out with Meet the Beatles and Introducing the Beatles, mm -hmm. I had two different aunts each give me one of, of those. and Album? Yeah, my gosh, we used and to listen to And it was your back, back porch. Uh, we call it back porch. That's just what we called it. But it, uh, it was a bedroom. It was a long, uh, as a matter of fact, this was Connor's baby room. See, I ended up buying the house that James grew up in, which was next door to my childhood home. I bought the, that house in 92. Uh, and then Connor was born in 93, and Connor's crib sat at the far end of the long back porch, which was James's bedroom. <laughs> Connor's crib, we used to lay on the floor right in front of where Connor's crib sat, and James had a little old portable uh, hi-fi record player. The top would unlatch, and the speakers would come out, you know, and you'd put the albums and records on there. And we laid on the floor and uh, listened to them Beatles albums. Before that, we listened to 45s because 45s was a big, big thing for for all of us. And we weren't but kids. I mean, eight, nine, ten-year-olds buying 45s. My, my aunt had a store downtown, and she would— Paint she, and tile. She had a—, a lady that would come cook for my grandparents who was up in their 80s during this time when we was young and uh her name was mary taylor and she lived across the street from the stadium and her husband played in a band uh his name was terry taylor and uh and they play at the elks club and all that kind of stuff i believe he was a drummer but mary introduced us to the soul music and uh when she would go to town with my grandmother uh i'd give her money and she'd buy me whatever record sam cook you know? mm -hmm. <laughs> it, that influenced us you know uh but i, I can't remember all the artists that mm -hmm. she bought for us but we definitely she had a influence on us was james part of the story that ended up in your song, How I Was. Yeah. I, about, yeah. The, about the burger chef. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Can y'all tell that, or is that too risque? We're three hours in here, probably. Oh, uh, well, this could be, uh, we could sign off and tell it. And, and uh, you, is it that bad? Well, it's a little bit, uh, I, it, 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 this I, ain't I, a deep end. Well, I mean, how far are we in are we? This ain't a deep end. This is a deep cut, though. Well, uh, I, I'm and some not, of that is downtime too. I don't know which it's the, incident that. It's the Burger Chef, the night that I uh, won't you uh, went tease down it? when y'all slipped the plane. <coughs> I slipped the earthly plane for won't the you, first time. Dave, won't you go ahead and sign us off, and and this will be a deep end snippet. <laughs> okay, just a quick story after. Yeah, and okay. uh, we 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 do this thing called the deep end on our Patreon. You can. Uh, we got a Patreon account. Yeah. Called uh, something in the water, the deep end, and it's a subscription only type thing. But it's only five dollars a month, and we. Uh, and that's what we're fixing to do here when we sign off. This is the free one on the. 
YouTube, but uh, and elsewhere, I mean, and elsewhere, all all the places that you can find podcasts. But we're going to do a, a, a really dip down into the deep end on this story, folks. So if you're interested in finding out what the heck we're uh, giggling yeah, it's, it's about, a little, it's a little more risque <laughs> stuff. But, uh, not always, but there's definitely some cool stuff on it. Yeah. We urge you to subscribe to our Patreon account, though it's $5 a month, and uh, there's some goodies involved, too. But we want to thank our good buddy, my old childhood buddy, and our good buddy, and, and, and just the fact that he's wearing a St. Louis Cardinal shirt, we won't hold it against him. <laughs> I was a Cardinal fan when the Braves was in Milwaukee. <laughs> so when, when, when they came down here, I was done hooked on the Cardinals because I could pick them up on my little transistor radio, <laughs> KMOX radio. Yeah, you probably Lewis. used to listen to Dizzy Dean. Uh, absolutely. But uh, the, the old announcer, Harry Carey, that mm-hmm. everybody associates with the Cubs, mm-hmm. he was a Cardinal announcer for 25 years. Nobody <laughs> knows that. Wow. So I grew up listening to him. But that's another story. <laughs> That's another story, and uh, and I won't even bring up the fact that you're an Alabama college football fan. <laughs> well, I, I try not to. I, I don't want to uh, alienate my my readers. <laughs> but that's another story. <laughs> Well, we we have enjoyed having you, James. Love you as always, and uh, we uh, thank you for being our guest. And uh, we, you have to come back. We will have to do this again with maybe with several Dog Hill <laughs> we, <laughs> gang members. Yeah, we'll have yeah. to do a, a full Dog Hill gang. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, we'll, that one won't be fit. <laughs> we'll, we'll just have to give out knives and guns when we come in the door. <laughs> We can do it in the community hall wherever Gary's church is. <laughs> no, that's right. <laughs> uh, Pray for forgiveness. Uh, so, well, folks, we appreciate you, and uh, come back again. And follow us all over to the deep end on Patreon. And I enjoyed it. Yeah. All right. Hey.